Kuzangpo, welcome to Bhutan e-learning program. I'm Khaganath Gajmer from Dampu Central School, Chirang. In today's uh, lesson, I'll be discussing about ionic equilibria, or in other words, it's also known as acid-base equilibria, which is for case stage five, for class 11 and 12. Here we go. In today's lesson, the objective that we are going to fulfill are uh, defined what is uh, acid-base equilibria, state Ostwald's dilution law, define conjugate acid and the conjugate base, explain conjugate acid base pair. Now these are the objectives that we are going to fulfill towards the end of our today's lesson on acid base equilibria. Now let's look at what is what we mean by weak acid or weak base, or in other words, we call it as strong electrolyte or weak electrolyte. Now, strong electrolyte are those substance, if you take this, for example, this particular molecule, if you take this molecule, now if you dissolve this molecule in water, this molecule will undergo dissociation and then form ions. For example, this particular molecule will dissociate in water and then form ions. Now, that is under strong electrolyte. Now, if you take strong electrolyte, let's take five molecules of a substance and then dissolve it in water, what happens is this particular electrolyte will undergo dissociation. Now, if you look at here, we, when we look at the number of molecules that are undergoing dissociation into ions, if you look at here, we have more number of molecules which has undergone dissociation to form ions. So this solution will have more number of ions. Now, if in case of weak electrolyte, now in this case, we, if we look at the electrolyte undergoes dissociation, undergoes dissociation almost completely. But if you look at this substance, another substance, now this substance also we take and then dissolve it in the water, will also undergo dissociation. Now in this case, what is happening is in the solution, most of the molecules that we have added in water remains undissociated. So only certain amount of it undergoes dissociation to form ions. Now such electrolytes or such substance which dissociate very, dissociate partially or incompletely in the solution are called weak electrolytes. Now in this case, this is a weak electrolyte. Now this is the weak electrolyte. If you compare the number of ions that, has, that is there in the solution, we have more number of ions. Here we have less number of ions. So this becomes strong electrolyte. This becomes weak electrolyte. So strong electrolyte dissociates almost completely, whereas weak electrolyte dissociates partially or incompletely in aqueous solution. If you look at an example of strong electrolyte, let's say acid, strong acid, we have HCl. Now, if you take this HCl and dissolve in water, it will form H plus ion and Cl minus ions. Now, in the solution, when we compare the number of dissociated ions and the undissociated molecule, we'll have larger concentration of dissociated molecules compared to that of undissociated molecule in the solution. So we say this particular acid is a strong acid. Now, if you look at weak electrolyte, for example, a weak acid, which is acetic acid, if you take this acid and dissolve in water, this will also form ions, which will also give H plus ion and then acetate ion. But in this case, you'll see that, we'll see that there will be larger concentration of undissociated molecule in the water as compared to the concentration of the dissociated ions. So this shows that the acid given is weak electrolyte. For example, if you take HCl and then dissolve it in water. In both the substance we take and then we take, dissolve them in the given volume of water. So this HCl will dissociate and give ions. This solution will have more number of ions compared to this one. So here we'll have fewer number of this ions when we'll have more number of this H plus and Cl minus in this solution. So this shows that HCl is a strong acid and then Acetic acid is a weak acid. Let's look at, these two are the examples of strong acid and weak acid. Let's look at 
The example of strong base, if we take sodium hydroxide and then dissolve in water, this will form ions, which are sodium ion and then hydroxyl ion, OH minus ion. So if we compare the number of undissociated molecule and the dissociated ions, we'll have larger concentration of dissociated ions than the undissociated molecule. So this shows that the given base is strong in nature. If you look at another example, which is a weak electrolyte, a base, ammonium hydroxide, this will also dissociate to give OH minus ions and ammonium ion. Now, when we compare the number of undissociated molecule and the dissociated ions, we'll have larger concentration of undissociated molecule compared to the dissociated ions. So this shows that this particular compound, which is a weak base, uh, uh, ammonium hydroxide, is a weak base or weak electrolyte. Now, in this chapter, we will be focusing particularly on those substances which are weak in nature, especially weak acids and weak bases. Because if we take strong acids and strong bases, these substances tend to completely dissociate and then give the ions, so there won't be any equilibrium. So this chapter will be focusing more on weak acids and weak bases. Let's define now what is acid-base equilibria then. We have already seen the dissociation of the electrolytes, under which we have also seen some electrolytes dissociate at a larger extent, some will dissociate to a smaller extent. Depending on that now, we'll, let's define what is acid-base equilibrium. Now, it is the equilibrium between the dissociated ions and the undissociated molecule of a weak electrolyte. Now, we cannot take strong electrolyte here because strong electrolyte tend to dissociate completely and there won't be an equilibrium between the undissociated molecule and the dissociated ions. Now, if you look at this weak substances like weak acid, acetic acid, and weak base, ammonium hydroxide, there is an equilibrium between the undissociated molecule and the dissociated ions. Now, the equilibrium between the dissociated ions and the undissociated molecule, this equilibrium is called acid-base equilibrium. Now let's look at what is degree of dissociation. Degree means to do with, to what it is to do with the extent of dissociation. Now degree of dissociation is defined as the extent to which an electrolyte dissociates in its aqueous solution. Now you if we take any substance and dissolve it in water, this substance tend to undergo dissociation. So we look at to what extent the substance has undergone dissociation. If it undergoes, let's say, up to 50%, so we see the degree of dissociation is 50%. That means half of the molecules have undergone dissociation. Mathematically, we calculate degree of dissociation in this, with this formula. It is calculated as number of moles of electrolyte which dissociate in the solution divided by the total number of moles of electrolyte that we take in the solution. So this is the mathematical formula to calculate degree of dissociation. Now let's look at, for example, if we take 1.5 moles of acetic acid, and out of which 0.3 mole undergoes dissociation in the solution, then we can calculate the degree of dissociation of this particular electrolyte as in this manner. So we take of 1.5, only 0.3 mole of it undergoes dissociation. So we have 0.3 divided by the total number of moles of electrolyte that we have taken is 1.5. So number of mo molecules undergoing dissociation is 0.3 divided by the total number of moles of electrolyte is 1.5. So it becomes 0.2. So degree of dissociation becomes 0.2. And in percentage, it is 20%, meaning out of 100, out of 100, only 20% of this particular electrolyte has undergone dissociation. Let's look at this example. If we take five molecules, five moles of a particular electrolyte, and we dissolve it in water, so out of five, it is showing that only two of the molecules have undergone dissociation to form ions. Now on, and then three molecules are left undissociated. So what happens is we calculate 
the degree of dissociation as 40%. So it becomes like two divided by five into 100. So it becomes 40%, meaning the electrolyte has undergone dissociation up to 40%. So that is the extent of dissociation. So that becomes the degree of dissociation. Now another one, if we take another type of electrolyte, let's look at here. Again, we take five moles of it, and then in the solution, we see that three molecules have undergone dissociation, and two of them have remained undissociated. And so this degree of dissociation for this particular electrolyte in this solution becomes 60%. So that is the degree of dissociation. To what extent a given electrolyte undergoes dissociation? when it is dissolved in a given volume of water. Now I have a question for you all. Let's look at it. See this, try this, after you have, if you have understood the concept of this degree of dissociation, answer this question. What would be the degree of dissociation for HCl? Think, and then find it out. First of all, you have to know the nature of HCl, and after that, you try to find out what would be its probable degree of dissociation. To what extent this particular compound will undergo dissociation when it is dissolved in water? And the second one, will there be acid-base equilibrium for nitric acid? If you take nitric acid and dissolve in water, will there be establishment of equilibrium between the dissociated ions and the undissociated molecules? So think over it and then answer these questions. Next, if we have a weak electrolyte, let's say weak acid, acetic acid, as I told you in this chapter, we'll be dealing only with, tho only with those electrolytes which are weak in nature, meaning they do not undergo complete dissociation when they are dissolved in water. Let's take an acetic acid. This acetic acid will dis dissociate in the solution in this manner. Those two arrows the, the shows the reversibility. That means the reaction can take place in both the direction. So there is an equilibrium being established between the undissociated molecule and the dissociated ions. Now in this case, if we apply the law of equilibrium, if we apply the law of equilibrium, we have this equilibrium equals to this, the product of concentration of the products divided by the product of concentrations of the reactant. So this is the formula and then we have this constant Ka, which is also called ionization or dissociation constant of acid. If we take acid, it becomes A. Ka A indicates this is the dissociation constant of acid. Now for base, if we take ammonium hydroxide, ammonium hydroxide will dissociate to give ammonium ion and OH minus ion. We can also have an equilibrium constant for this particular base, which is weak in nature. So this Ka indicates ionization constant or dissociation constant of base. Now let's look at what is strength of acid and base. Strength of acid, if we take, if we, when we talk about strength of acid, it is to do with the capacity of an acid to give H plus ions in its aqueous solution. When we say acid, any compound that gives H plus ions, when it is dissolved in water, that particular substance will be, come under acid. So acid, in general, we define acid as those substances which gives H plus ion when it is being dissolved in water. Now, different acids, we have different categories of acids. Some acids are strong acids, some are weak, some are neither strong nor weak. So we talk about their strength. Now, the here strength means their capacity. To what extent they give, they produce H plus ions when they are dissolved in water. So we have that strength. We talk the nature of these acids in terms of the strength. Now, for example, if we take these two acids, now the strength of acids will depend on the value of their ionization constant. If we have larger value of ionization constant, their acetic strength is also higher. For example, if we take two acids, we have acetic acid and hydrocyanic acid. These two acids have the Ka value of 1.8. Acetic acid has 1.8 into 10 to the power minus 5. This is the Ka value for acetic acid. 
Then other acid we have is one uh, hydrocyanic acid with the ionization constant value of 7.1 into 10 to the power minus 10. Now, if you compare the Ka value, the ionization constant value, we see that acetic acid has higher value compared to this hydrocyanic acid. So, we say acetic acid is stronger than hydrocyanic acid. So, with the values of ionization constant, we will be able to know, we'll be able to predict the strength of a given acid. Similarly, we can also have strength of base. Now, the strength of base is defined as its capacity to give OH minus ions in the aqueous solution. So, if we take base and then dissolve different bases, we take equimolar solution, equimolar solution of bases and then we dissolve in water. So, we compare to what extent they give OH minus ion, then accordingly we say that if they have more number of OH minus ions in the solution, we say that the base is stronger compared to the other base. Now, what is the difference? Uh, commonly, we come across, frequently, we come across these two terms, strength and then concentration. Now, what is the difference? What are the, some of the differences between them? Now, strength is to do with capacity, and it pertains to nature of acid. Now, concentration is to do with number of ions. For example, if I take, let's take, let's take an acetic acid, acetic acid, acetic acid, and then I take HCl here. Now, I add here, I have taken acetic acid as, let's say, five moles. Five moles I have taken, and HCl also I have taken, let's say, five moles. Now, I take these two acids and then equal number of acids, in equal amount of acids, I take it and then dissolve it in water. Now, both of them will dissociate and then give ions in the aqua solution. Now, in this case, I take, let's say, uh, it gives H plus and then CS3. COO minus. We have H plus ion and acetate ion. Similarly, HCl will also give H plus and then Cl minus ions. Now, when we look at the number of ions in the solution, in this two solution, in the solution, let's say we have 1.0 mole ions. And the number of moles of ions found in the solution of this acid it is found out to be the number of moles of ions are only 1.0 mole. But in case of, let's say, HCl, let's say we have 5.0 mole only, moles only. So we see that, we see that this HCl has given more number of ions compared to this acid. So we say this HCl has higher strength compared to this one. So they have different strength. But when we look at their concentration, Concentration. Concentration means to do with the amount. So that their concentrations are same. We have taken the same concentration, but they have different strength. So concentration is to do with the quantity, and strength is to do with the nature. So these are the differences between strength and concentration. So when we say HCl, HCl is stronger in terms of strength, it is higher than the acetic acid. It has higher strength than the acetic acid. Likewise, we have sulfuric acid, nitric acids, which have higher strength. And we also have other acids like carbonic acid, acetic acid, citric acids. All these acids are, have lower strength, and we say they are weak acids. So these are the differences between strength of an acid, uh, compound, uh, strength of acid to a base and the, their concentrations. Let's look at the another topic under this chapter, ionic equilibria. We have Ostwald's dilution law. Now, what is Ostwald's dilution law? Let's look at this solutions first. Let's take a beaker of a water. Let's say we have certain volume of water in this beaker. And then we take, let's say, 10 ml of this acetic acid. We have acetic acid solution and we take 10 ml of it and then put it in this water, dissolve it in this water. 
Now, in another case, you take this, another same size beaker and you double the volume of water, pure water. If you are taking this much here, you double it here. So that means you have more double amount. I mean, the volume of water here is double compared to this. Now, here also, you take 10 ml of acetic acid, one molar acetic acid, and put it in this water. So in both the cases, you add same amount of acetic acid, but having different volume of water. Now what will happen is, this will give a solution now. Previously it was water now. Before it was water, now it has become solution. Now, here also, now it becomes solution. Now let's look at this acetic acid after being added in the water. In the water, it will dissociate and then give H plus ion and then acetate ion. Now when we look at, when we compare the number of ions, in this case it is found number of H plus ions are found to be 10 to the power minus 6, where we will also have equal number of acetate ion, which is also 10 to the power minus 6. Now in this case, also the number of ions of hydrogen and acetate are counted. Now in this case, the hydrogen ion is found out to be 10 to the power minus 5. And here also acetate ion 10 to the power minus 5. So when we compare the number of ions, though we have taken same amount of acetic acid in different volumes of water, we'll find that in both of these solution, the numbers are different. So here we see that when we have higher volume, when we double the volume, the number of ions have become higher than this. So here we have less number of ions compared to this. So higher the volume, more is the number of ions. So that shows that Ostwald given explanation that if we increase the volume of a solution containing a weak electrolyte, that particular electrolyte will dissociate to higher extent. That means more dissociation of this molecule will take place in the solution. So that was given by, that was being observed by Ostwald. And then we have a law which is called Ostwald's dilution law. Before we give the statement of this law, let's look at its mathematical form. Let's take a weak electrolyte, which is AV. Let's take AV as the weak electrolyte. Now this AV, we put it in water, we dissolve it in water, and then it will dissociate in this manner. It will form A plus and B minus ions. Now suppose we take one mole of this weak electrolyte in V liter of solution. Now what will happen, and then its degree of dissociation is alpha. So this AV can undergo that extent of dissociation of this weak electrolyte AV is let it be alpha. Now in this case, in the dissociation in the initial amount, in the initial amount, initially let's say the dissociation has not taken place. That means we have taken one mole and the ions are not being formed, so we have zero, zero initially. Now after that, after adding water, certain volume of water, this particular electrolyte will undergo dissociation. And then there will be backward forward, backward forward reaction will be there, reversible reaction will take place, and then at certain state, at certain stage, the equilibrium will be established. That time, when we look at the number of ions which has undergone dissociated, and the, concept, the number of molecules which has remained undissociated is calculated in this manner. So it becomes alpha into total. Initially it is zero, now alpha into total. If we take 100 molecules, and if it is 30% of it has undergone dissociation, means we have 30 molecules. So we have, so alpha into the total. So this will be the number, their numbers will be same. So this will be the number of ions which are there in the solution. Now the number of molecules which has remained undissociated will be the total which has undergone dissociated minus the total number, I mean, whatever the molecules that have undergone dissociated minus the total number of molecules that we have taken. So it becomes one minus alpha in this case. Now these are concentrations. I mean, these are the number of moles of ions and then molecule at equilibrium. Now in terms of concentration, we can have number of moles is this one, divided by volume. Concentration should be taken in terms of number of moles in a given volume. So we take the volume, divided by volume. Here also concentration will be alpha for this A plus ions, the concentration will be alpha divided by V. 
Here also we have the alpha divided by V. Now, if we use the law of equilibrium, then we have this equilibrium constant, product, and then reactant. So we take the concentration of this one, A by V, A by V, and this also volume is there. Now, after doing necessary calculations, so we'll have ultimately this formula, and this alpha square divided by one minus alpha divided by V. Now for a dilute solution, what we do is your alpha, one minus alpha is very, very small. For example, if one, if alpha is, let's say, equal to 0 0.000001, 001, if we take this as the alpha volume, I mean the value of alpha, then our one minus alpha would be almost equal to one. So therefore, we neglect this part. We neglect this part, so our equation becomes now k equals to alpha square divided by volume. This part is being neglected. So in other words, alpha is equal to root of kv, or alpha is also equal to root of k divided by c. Now, if you look at this one, we can, from this formula, we can state what is Ostwald's dilution law. Now, from this equation, we can define it. We can state the law. So thus, the Ostwald law, Ostwald's dilution law states that the degree of dissociation of a weak electrolyte at a particular temperature is directly proportional to the square root of dilution volume or inversely proportional to square root of concentration. Now from this formula, we can clearly see that the degree of dissociation of a weak electrolyte is directly proportional to the square root of dilution volume. So which means if we take more volume, there will be more dissociation of the electrolyte. Or in terms of concentration, it is inversely proportional to the square root of concentration because the volume and concentrations are inversely proportional. So if you have more volume, the concentration will be low. If you have more concentration, that means the volume is very small. So they are inversely, that's why we state Ostwald's dilution law in this manner, looking at the equation. Next, we, let's look at what we mean by acid and base. Let's look at some of the concepts of acid and base, which is being given by different person. According to Ernest's concept, acids, it is being defined as those substances which produce H plus ions or hydronium ions in aqueous solution. For example, all of them are acids, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, carbonic acid, acetic acid. They are all example of acids because when we dissolve them in water, they produce H plus ions or hydrogen ions. Therefore, they are called acids. So that's according to Erinus concept. Now, according to Erinus concept, the bases are those substances which produce OH minus ions in aqueous solution. For example, all of this sodium hydroxide, ammonium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, copper hydroxide, they produce OH minus ions when we dissolve them in water. So they, be, they are the Erinus bases. Now we have another concept being given, which is a Bronsted concept, or it is also based on proton concept. So Bronsted has given another concept, I mean, another definition of acids and bases. Now, according to this concept, Bronsted concept, acids are those chemical species which lose proton. So all those chemical species which lose proton they are referred to as acids. And for example, and the bases are those substances which produce, I mean, which accept proton, which accept proton. So here we are defining acid and base in terms of proton. If you look at here, here it is in terms of H plus ion and OH minus ion. But in this concept, it is totally based on the proton, whether the proton is lost or gained. Now, if a substance loses proton, that particular compound is referred to as acid. And if a particular compound accepts proton, then it is known as base. 
So assets are proton donor, bases are proton acceptor. Let's look at the example. If we take HCl, if we dissolve it in water, it will give H plus ion and Cl minus ion. Here, HCl is producing H plus ion. Therefore, it is a bronze state acid. Now, if you look at, in this case, chlorine, chloride ion, Cl minus ion is accepting proton. It's accepting proton. So therefore, Cl minus become bronze state base. Another example, if you look at here, ammonium ion is losing proton. Therefore, it becomes bronze state acid. And in this case, ammonium, ammonium molecule accepts proton. So here it is accepting proton. So it becomes bronze state base. So here it is losing the proton. So it is bronze state acid. Here it is accepting the proton. So it is bronze state base. So these are the concepts of acid and base given by bronze state. So it is a protonic concept, meaning it is defined based on whether the substance lose proton or gain proton. Now let's look at what is conjugate acid base pair. Now conjugate acid base pair are those substances which differ one another by a proton. They are pair of compounds, they differ by a pair of proton. Let's look at example. If we like take HCl, if we take HCl as an acid, and then in the solution, it will lose proton and then form Cl minus. Now in this case, this HCl becomes an acid and it's whatever the product is being formed after losing proton that becomes its conjugate base. So here HCl is an acid and Cl minus is the conjugate base of this acid. In this case, the ammonia molecule accepts proton. So ammonia becomes a base. Now after accepting proton, it becomes ammonium ion. So therefore, ammonium ion becomes conjugate acid of this base. So they are called now acid-base pairs. They are the acid-base pairs. Now, in this kind of neutralization reaction, where we have HCl and ammonia, acid and base reacting together, which is called neutralization reaction. In this reaction, hydrochloric acid will donate proton to ammonia molecule. And then it will form, now after donating, the product that HCl after losing proton will form Cl minus. And this ammonia molecule after accepting proton will form ammonium ion. Now in this reaction, this is a neutralization reaction, now in this reaction, if we have to find out the conjugate acid base pairs, so we have here HCl is an acid, so its base will become Cl minus. So therefore, these two are called acid base pair. And in this case, ammonia is base, it accepts proton and form ammonium ion. So these two are called conjugate acid base pairs. So this is how we find out. After losing a proton, a compound, if an acid loses its proton, then it will form conjugate base. And if a base accepts proton, it will lead to formation of conjugate acid. So that's how we identify conjugate acid base pair in a given reaction, neutralization reaction especially. Now in this case, if you have acetic acid, now acetic acid you dissolve in water, acetic acid will donate proton to water and form acetate ion. So acetic acid and acetate ion become conjugate acid base pair. And water accepts proton from acetic acid, so it's a base. And then it will form hydronium ion. So this two will again become acid base pair. So in other reverse reaction, what, we can, what is happening is the hydronium ion can give proton to acetate ion, again form back this two reactants, back to the reactants. So that's how we identify acid base pairs in a given neutralization reaction. Now questions, I have a question for you. If you have understood the concept, the above concepts, then try this. Write the conjugate base of the following species. Let's say carbonic acid, this one, then bicarb bicarbonate ion, hydrogen sulfide, for example, if I do the first one, if I do the first one, 
if we have carbonic acid, if it is an acid, it's an acid. Now, how do you find its conjugate base? What you have to do is the, the pair of a compound will differ by a proton. A proton, one proton. So what you have to write is just write one proton and then CO3 plus H plus. So here it will be C minus because one proton is being lost from the molecule. Now these two compounds, now if it is acid, this becomes conjugate, it's conjugate base. So these two species, they differ by a proton. Here we have one, here we have two. So they differ by a proton. So if, it, if this is the case, that's how we find the conjugate acid base pairs. So you try for the second species, which is a bicarbonate ion. Also find out for hydrogen sulfide, its conjugate base. And the question, write the conjugate acid of the following. Now, if you're above one is to write base. Now the below, lower one is to find out its acid. Now, if it is OH minus iron, for example, if I take OH minus iron, OH minus iron. Now, if you have to find out its acid, if you have to find out by acid, now what will happen is you add one proton here. You add one proton here, and then it will form now H2O, so water. So water becomes the conjugate acid of OH minus iron. So that's how you find out. So if you want to find out, if you are given an acid, if you want to find out its conjugate base, just release one proton, and then whatever product you get, that becomes its base. If you are given a base, if you want to find out its acid, just add one proton, and the whatever product that you get will become its conjugate acid. So that's how you do it. And then try for this bisulfate ion, and then sulfate ion. For this species, you try to find out their conjugate acid. Let's look at the ionic product of water. At certain temperature, we see that water tends to undergo ionization in this manner. So water will undergo ionization to form H plus ion and OH minus ion. But the degree of dissociation, the ionization of this water is very, very small. That means it undergoes ionization to a very small extent. So the number of ions of water and OH minus formed will be very, very low. But it does undergo ionization. So here it forms H plus ion and OH minus ion. At the same time, or in other words, we can also express ionization of water in this manner, hydronium ion, it will form hydronium ion and OH minus ion. Now if you look at, so if you look at the equilibrium constant for dissociation of water, this is how, what we get, this is the formula. And from here, if we multiply K into water, water, then what will happen is this concentration of water in any volume tends to remain constant, which means the number of water molecules that has remained undissociated is very, very high. That means only small amount of water has undergone dissociation. It appears as if the water has not undergone dissociation. So this concentration of water, though it has undergone dissociation, it tends to be remaining constant. So we have constant, equilibrium constant, or ionization constant of water into water, concentration of water, which is another constant. So we get this formula. So K into constant, which is called Kw. So Kw is the product of concentration of H plus ion and OH minus ion. Therefore, this Kw is called, Kw is called ionic product of water. So how we define ionic product of water? Here from this equation we can define as is the product of concentration of hydrogen ion and hydroxyl ion at a particular temperature. This product is called ionic product of water. Now at certain temperature, let's say at 25 degrees Celsius, the ionic product of water is found out to be 10 to the power minus 14. That's what they have calculated, what, what is being found at 25 degrees Celsius, which is very, very, very low. And then in water, we know that we have equal number of ions of H plus and OH minus ion in the water. So what will happen is if we take the value of ionic product of water as 10 to the power minus 14, these two are equal in quantities, equal in number, therefore this should be 10 to the power minus 7 and 10 to the power minus 7. 
So we have concentration of H plus ion as 10 to the power minus 7, also which is equal to concentration of OH minus ion, equal, which is also in equal number, which is 10 to the power minus 7 mole per liter. So we see that the concentration of H plus ion and OH minus ions are very, very small. So this is called ionic product of water. Now, as the degree of dissociation, as the degree of dissociation increases with increase in temperature. For example, if you look at in the solution, in, in any form of solution, the number of H plus ions or OH ions, minus ions might change, but their product will always remain same. For example, if a solution contains 10 to the power minus 3 mole per liter of H plus ion, then we can calculate OH minus of ions in that particular solution. So we know ionic product of water is concentration of H plus ion and OH minus ion. Now in this case, we know the ionic product of water is 10 to the power minus 14. We know H plus ion is H plus ion is 10 to the power minus 3. So accordingly, we can calculate this. So we have OH minus ion as 10 to the power minus 11 mole per liter. So again, if we multiply OH minus ion and H plus ion concentrations, we should be getting 10 to the power minus 14, which is the ionic product value of water at 25 degree Celsius. So nature of the solution depending on relative concentrations, if we have more number of H plus ion in the solution than OH minus solution, OH minus ions, then it is acidic solution. And if we have less number of H plus ion, the solution becomes basic. And if we have equal number of H plus ion and OH minus ion in the solution, it becomes a neutral solution. Let's look at what we have done today. Uh, we have explained, we have learned about strong electrolyte and weak electrolyte, acid-base equilibria, Ostwald's dilution law, conjugate acid-base pair, ionic product of water. These are the things that we have discussed in today's lesson. Now, try these questions. If you have understood the concepts that we have learned today, try these questions. To which of the solution of following substance the Ostwald's dilution law is not applicable? Now, if you take carbonic acid, nitric acid, phosphoric acid, and potassium hydroxide, you find out in which of these compounds the Ostol dilution law is not applicable. Then what do you mean by conjugate acid base pair? And then complete the following and indicate the conjugate acid base pair in each case. Now in this two, you find out, you complete the reaction and then find out acid base, conjugate acid base pairs in the reaction. So with this, we have come to the end of today's lesson. I'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you so much.